actually? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's the reason that we're both not teaching anymore. It's not the job that we went into. You can't have the impact that you want to have on the kids because there's just too much else going on. There's not enough time unless you are actually superhuman. So, the best way to hear the truth about what's going on in schools in the United Kingdom is to actually speak to ex-teachers. You will be hearing from Emily and Paul who've started their own business helping parents to help their kids. Very, very brave. It's a brand new business. It's taking off and they're doing an excellent thing. I know you're going to enjoy the next hour or so listening to the hugely passionate Emily and Paul. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Emily and Paul. How are you both today? Good, thank you very much. Good, thanks. So this is an absolute first for the Share Your Story podcast. I've got two guests on uh, who are working together in the same business. So it's going to be super interesting how I'm going to manage you both <laughs> and uh, get the, well, we'll get the answers. Behave. <laughs> oh, you will behave. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. So for the first question I'm going to ask, and it's really only my only question to get started. Um, you're going to have to take it in turn, of course, and ladies go first. <laughs> um, so I'd like you both to tell us a little bit about your personal life to start with. So where were you born? A little bit about your education. Have you moved around? Where do you now live? Um, so it's in, it'll be interesting to get your perspectives on both of that. So over to you, Emily, first. Well, hello. Um, so I'm Emily Hughes. I was born in Loughborough General Hospital. It should have been Leicester General Hospital, but I was like, no, other way around. I was a little bit awkward and I didn't really want to come out. And yeah. mum says, I've been stubborn ever since. Oh. Um, <laughs> True story. Brilliant. Easy. Um, so I uh, moved to Peterborough when I was one and haven't really left apart from to to go off to university. So I studied at the, the local community school and uh, got good grades. And for some reason, which I can't quite remember now, I was persuaded to apply to Cambridge University thinking that will never happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it did. So wow. I ended up going off to Cambridge to study maths with education. And that's about the furthest away from Peterborough I've been. And it's only about an hour. Uh, yeah. Then came back to Peterborough and um, that's uh, that's where I am now. So I am married to a very wonderful man. I have to say that because he's sitting next to me. Of course. Uh, to Paul. True story. <laughs> and uh, we have three children. So uh, two stepsons of mine, sons of Paul, uh, who are 17. So they've recently been through their GCSEs and we're now going through the joys of A-levels. They right. both passed their driving test, so that's one mm -hmm. thing ticked off the list. But there's still plenty to go. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we have an 11-year-old daughter who is going on about 23 and mm -hmm. entertains us on a daily basis with her wonderful little quirks and her obsession with gymnastics. So she spends most of her time upside down at the moment. Indeed. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Fabulous. And just to, to ask then, in terms of your well we'll come back to that we'll come back to that okay is that you about done uh, i think so yeah over to you paul okay well i haven't lived in peterborough most of my life i uh, was born uh, in ely hospital an ref hospital uh, and uh, pretty much for the first 20 something years or so i was an ref brat i suppose i moved from uh, ely to you know lots of places around peterborough uh, area but I've also lived in uh, Cyprus. Um, I say I lived in Hong Kong. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Yes. And, uh, and Germany as well. Mm. Um, but at the age of 10, I was pitched off to boarding school uh, for eight years, which sounds fairly horrendous. Now we've got a 10, 11 year old ourselves. And the idea of sending her off and being independent at that age is a bit scary. But anyway, I, I loved it. Loved eight years of school. It was a fabulous school. Um, and then from 
uh, from Oakham School. I then went to uh, Coventry University. Uh, did a degree in geography, which people do take the mickey about because when there's any quiz questions about capital cities, apparently, for whatever reason, <laughs> I, I think rubbish is harsh, but I, I struggle sometimes. Um, and then after I finished that, I, uh, I then went to do a master's degree at Sheffield University in uh, computing and information management. And, uh, and then I, the world of work. So oh. if I can jump in for a minute, I'd like to tell the story about why he says he lives in Hong Kong, because right. I, I tell it better. Oh, Whenever good. We do, we're, we're going back to the pub quizzes. Whenever there's a music round, Paul is notoriously useless. Yes. Um, I think he once suggested that Hey Jude might have been written by the Beach Boys. That's the kind of <laughs> level we're talking about here. And he claims it's because he lived in Hong Kong, so he missed out on all of this. Right. What he means is that for like six weeks each year, while he was on school holidays, he went and stayed with his parents who were living in Hong Kong. And right. the rest of the time he was here. So it's his favourite excuse for not knowing stuff. <laughs> yeah. So just to clarify, I've been uh, <laughs> apparently not very good at geography and certainly capital cities, not very good at music. However, uh, when it comes to sport and ridiculous mm. questions about anything to do with football dating back 40 years or so, I, I know everything. So I do have an inside encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of football trivia. Um, it's geography and music I struggle with. So he's got his priorities, right? Brilliant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And um, so when so when you went through all of the education, both of you, and can take it in turn again, um, ha what what happened in terms of career then after that? Where did you go? I, I will jump in first then. Mm. So I I always wanted to do one of two things when I was younger, I either wanted to sing on stage in the West End mm. or I wanted to be a teacher because I loved working with little kids. I thoroughly enjoyed it, did lots of stuff. Um, so at secondary school, we'd finish at one o'clock on a Friday and have enrichment time, which I use inverted commas for. Uh, and I used to go back to my old primary school and help out in the younger years, which right. I absolutely loved. Right. So it was one of the two. And when it came to uni, it was a toss up between doing, I think it was dance and maths as a combined degree, which was a very oh. odd combination, but, you know, um, or getting into Cambridge, which is what then happened and threw everything else out of the window. Right. So from that point onwards, it became teaching. So I trained as a teacher and taught for 15 years until a couple of years ago when I left and uh, started up the business. But that's a whole another part of the story. Yeah, so yeah. Let go. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're talking about from university onwards. Uh, essentially, my well, end of school, start of university, all the way through university. In fact, I, I was not particularly well. Um, had a few issues with my hips, and uh, long story short is that by the time I was twenty-five, I'd had uh, two hip replacements. Whoa! So I kind of, as soon as I finished my education, as soon as I finished getting better, as it were, uh, my approach was to basically go travelling. Uh, and spend as much time traveling as I possibly could and working at the same time. So I went back to Hong Kong. I went to Thailand. I went to Australia. And uh, the only reason I like to think I came home is because the cash ran out. Mm. Uh, and at that point, I think I was about 27. I was forced to be uh, an adult and grown up and get a job. <laughs> and uh, I went and started working in banking uh, in Peterborough for uh, Barclays. OK. And then uh, from Barclays or from Peterborough, I went down to work in London because more jobs, more money, etc., um, and I did that for about three years. And the only reason I gave up was because um, uh, I had twins and basically with the London sort of commuting lifestyle, I wasn't seeing them. Mm. So it was a case of I need to uh, train to do something else. And that's where teaching came in. And I've been well, or had been up until recently teaching in Peterborough ever since. So from so banking to teaching. Um, it was very much uh, uh, based on the fact that I needed to do something. It seems bizarre to say it at the time. I needed something that would give me the time yes. to uh, spend time with the children, but probably teaching on reflection, not the best job to go <laughs> no, into to have no. quality time with your family. Mm. Uh, at the time, it seemed like a brilliant idea. And, uh, and you know, I've, I've enjoyed the majority of it, it's fair to say, but uh, new challenges now. And yeah, so here we go. And I guess you thought term time allowing you plenty of time with the kids. <laughs> yeah, it uh, turns out it doesn't quite work that way. It's uh, it's all it's planning and marking and paperwork and red tape. And I think 
the problem is as a teacher you you don't you don't get into teaching for the money you get into teaching because you care Mm. and if you care you spend the extra time and you go the extra mile which means most teachers work ridiculous hours sort Mm. of you know 12 to 14 hours a day and you're still working at the weekends and you're still getting everything sorted because there's a never-ending pile of paperwork so it's uh it's not as conducive to family life as you would hope, is it? Nope. No, but and that's why we're out now. So Paul and I actually started teaching at the same time. Yes. And we, uh, we same, met yeah. at the, starting at the same school. So same day, we both oh. rocked up two different um, sort of teacher training routes. Right. But we ended up at the same school um, doing kind of the same the same stage. So we've known each other since then, and we were kind of – we vaguely knew each other we were in different departments so mm. uh, we didn't we didn't see each other that often no. and uh, we were both married to other people at that point <laughs> right and uh, we eventually bonded out. i think it was someone's leaving do or something we were chatting at the bar about um what turned out to be a shared experience of getting divorced yes and uh, and that was really it um I, I paul can explain to you what it was that tipped the scales for him i think <laughs> slightly <laughs> Slightly on the spot there, but uh, Emily had just bought uh, a motorbike. And, right. uh, and uh, obviously, if you have a motorbike, you apparently need to have motorbike leathers. And uh, she had uh, what I described as quite, um, well, uh, quite a good look, should we say, in the motorbike leathers. <laughs> and at that point, I'm not going to say anything else for fear no. of getting a slap. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And uh, are you allowed to say which school that was? Um, well, if, if you tell I, us we're allowed to, yeah. Yes, I think we probably can. We were at uh, what was then Stanground College in, in Peterborough. It's now Stanground Academy because it's gone the way of most schools and yes. uh, it's been taken over by a trust, yeah. Now, I'm so, not, I don't want to be political on this podcast, but I, I'm like on the tip of my tongue, I can't resist asking the question, were you guys affected in because you mentioned, you know, all the long hours and everything else that you've got to do, but... <laughs> What's the impact of all the cuts and everything that happened over the past kind of decade? Did that impact you guys in terms of the amount of work you had to do? Well, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's the reason that we're both not teaching anymore. It's right. not the job that we went into. You can't have the impact that you want to have on the kids because there's just too much else going on. There's not enough time unless you are actually superhuman Mm. You you can't physically do all the stuff that you used to be able to do. You know, getting involved in the extracurricular stuff and actually getting to know the kids properly and spending a little bit of time with them because that's what makes the difference. It's relationships. Mm. And if the kids know you and you know them, it makes it easier to deal with all the other stuff because they're teenagers. They come out with dramas because that's how it works. That's mm. how teenage brains work. Mm. And And if you know them, then you know not to take it personally and you know how to talk them back down again when they're having one of those moments. And yeah. that's just something that you you really can't do properly yeah. anymore. And mm. it, yeah. it was just unsustainable. I mean, I, one of the best examples I've got of um, the effect of cuts is that uh, when I first started being a sixth form tutor, we used to have a, a bonding day. <clears throat> Excuse me. We used to have a bonding day in, uh, in Cambridge and mm. uh, we'd, go, we'd go punting. And we'd go shopping and uh, everyone would get to know everyone and your tutor would get to know the students, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and that was fabulous. But then we had to stop doing that because we didn't have the money to do that trip. We had to then sort of do something a bit close to home. Mm. So rather than going from Peterborough to Cambridge, we then went from Peterborough to Fine Shades Wood, where we would, it's a lovely place. We'd walk around for a couple of hours, three hours, we'd bond. And it was, you know, still fantastic, but it wasn't Cambridge. And, but, you know, you, you live within your means. And yes. then we couldn't afford to do that either. And now, literally, we get a bus to a local park and walk around. It's lit a mile away from the school. Uh, and the only reason is, it's just we don't have the money to do it. Mm. Uh, and year on year on year, uh, we see those budgets shrinking. We see the impact it has on teachers and students. Um, it's harder and harder to get teachers in the door because uh, pay has been frozen for so long. Mm. Why would graduates be teachers when they can earn proper money, so to speak? Uh, in a different profession, it's mm. um, it's very very straightforward, and and I guess a, a big part of it is everyone's counting on teachers really having that love for teaching and love for kids, 
that they are almost doing it for almost nothing and spending a lot of extra time for nothing into the job yeah. and, and, and with the cuts having to, to do that as well. When we started, that was absolutely the case. But I think as, as time has gone on and, and the cuts have kind of cut deeper, I suppose, it, I think it's just got to the point where it's unsustainable. Teachers are asked to do more for less. And there comes a tipping point when you probably when you've been in doing your career, you've been in that career for a bit longer mm. where you just think it is unsustainable. And, you know, I can't imagine carry on doing this for another 10, 15 years until I retire. We had to we had to come up with a plan B, which so far um, is working beautifully. Yeah, burnout is a very, very <laughs> real thing in the teaching profession at the moment. Right. We're seeing it with a lot of friends that they're just, um, they're having to be signed off because they are not capable mm. of, of continuing in, in the way that they have been. I, I was, um, and that wasn't even, that wasn't really to do with the work. It certainly wasn't to do with the kids or the teaching. Mm. It was to do with the management and the, the pressure that is put on you as a teacher, yeah. whether that's from the senior leadership or whether that's from Ofsted. And um, there was a point in an, a, a different school by then where it just it was way too much. And I was just I was driving to and from school in tears, just didn't want to be there, couldn't do it. Wow. Ended up um, it was just before Christmas. And you normally have. So every teacher will be able to tell you that at the end of the holiday for the last two or three days before you go back, you start to have the back to work blues mm -hmm. and you start to have the nightmares where you, I don't know, get put in front of a class teaching something that you've never taught before. And suddenly there's an inspector there mm. or you find out that morning that you're in charge of a school trip and no one's told you about it. Mm. And all the kids end up going missing. It's it's like that. Um, my back to work blues started much sooner. And Paul could see the state I was in and said, look, you just really really should take a little bit of time. You shouldn't go back if it's making you feel like that. And uh, so I got signed off for a week just to kind of get my head straight. And I think at that point, my brain decided that, all oh, good, we, we can stop trying to cope now. And it just broke. And yeah. I was uh, signed off for, I think, three months in the end with uh, uh, with depression. It was it was not a fun time for any of us, <laughs> just to put it very mildly. Um, but I, I still went back to teaching and, and gave it another whirl and then ended up in another post in another school where, again, I just wasn't being supported. My, my manager was not the most fun person to work with. Mm. And I decided in the end that my sanity was more important than my salary. And I quit uh, without another job to go to. And, and that experience was the beginnings of setting up this business and getting out of teaching and doing something which is sort of teaching adjacent. I like to describe it, mm -hmm. all the things that we do. It's it's still using all the, the skill set that we've developed over the years as teachers. Yes. But I feel like we actually get to make more difference now. Um, and we get to do it in our own time, on our own terms. And we get to actually be human beings at the same time, which mm -hmm. is nice. <laughs> yep. That is absolutely brilliant, and it. I, I'm not going to labour the point in terms of burnout and all of that, and the state of the schools, etc. But just the last point, perhaps to make, from from where I'm, where we're sitting, I guess. I, I got involved in the past year with um, something called Japanese taiko drumming, and my teacher, he teaches kids in schools. Um, primary and secondary, mainly secondary schools, uh, like teenagers and whatever. And we've just, um, I convinced them to come locally to where I am, I'm in Worcestershire, to go to a secondary school and we hire a hall there at the weekend. And he's been really nervous about it. And I, I like, you know, everything seems to be working out fine. I've got good communication. He goes, yes, he says, I know, but all my dealings with secondary schools they are literally 60 seconds away from complete chaos. <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. the most accurate description of secondary schools I've heard in a while. Yeah. yeah. And um, so when you're kind of sharing some of your stories, I, I'm now, I, I kind of went, well, what's the matter with him? Why is he so nervous about, you know, just hiring a hall at a school? And obviously he's right. I mean, he's been dealing with secondary schools for years and it's always never been a great, great experience. I mean, what he's been doing specifically is like a schools and communities project. And he's been doing that uh, actively for the past five years, 
which have obviously been in the middle of how the cuts have been biting. Um, and he's very, very vocal about the cuts and stuff. I mean, they've cut music departments and he's trying to tell people, you know, get a new art form of music into schools and, and it's been really, really tough. So anyway, yeah, OK. Go ahead, Paul. It's so important to get the, the arts in school. It makes such a difference to particularly the kids that just aren't on that academic. Mm. Otherwise, it's five years of utter misery because they've got no outlet. They've got yes. no way to express themselves. Mm. Nothing to make up for the fact that, you know, maybe they feel like they're rubbish at all the academic subjects. They feel like they're failing all of the time. They don't get to show the other side of, of yes. what they do. And mm. it's so important. I mean, uh, as I said before, my, my two possible job routes when I was younger was to sing on stage in the West End or, or teach. And yes. I've kind of got slightly back into the, the singing thing more recently. I run Great. a choir locally, which Great. I love. Yeah. And it's like an hour and a half of therapy for me each week. It's just everything else goes out of the window, all the stresses, and you just get to, to sing and just mm. I, singing has so many health benefits. Yeah. And it's the sort of thing that kids just don't get to do enough of nowadays because Teachers don't have the time and the space. All the extracurricular stuff is down to the, the kindness of teachers. Nobody gets paid for doing the extra clubs. Yeah. So if they do it, it's just because they've decided they want to give up their time. And, and just there aren't enough hours in the day for that anymore. It's really no. sad. Now, were you going to say something, Paul? Um, I, I was. It's probably a slightly political point, but it was about, um, mm. yeah, the number of um, uh, the curriculum offer, I suppose, the number of subjects, uh, different uh, arts, for example, that are offered, I think, at any school, but certainly the school that we uh, used to work at um, has probably, I'm, I'm guessing, about halved. Yeah. So when students do turn up, for example, in sixth form, wanting to study um, a range of different subjects, more often than not, that range isn't available. And that's mm. not to do with uh, the school, the academy, whatever, or where it is, but it's because they haven't got the money to to put on the classes, mm. and um, because those subjects aren't being valued by <clears throat> the the kind of the government, the people in charge yeah. of education, mm. and so they are being gradually weeded out of the yeah. curriculum. I think, uh, uh, and other, uh, the other point being that a lot of the time the um, subjects don't run because there are no teachers. So you don't have yeah. a teacher who's a specialist in music, a specialist in uh, whatever it might be, so uh, they don't run it. No. And and this is so short sighted, and it doesn't matter that we continue to talk about this because it's a really important point. It's so mm. short sighted because what businesses need more than anything, top of the list, is creativity, right? Absolutely, yeah. They need creativity. They need new ideas. The only way you can get people to be creative if they've experienced creativity themselves, you know, yeah. and you can't be creative just. OK, you can be creative in every subject. I get that. But the creative arts are important to pull out a level of creativity that kid, well, kids do know. But even when they get older in their teenage years, they don't think they are creative. I mean, I've grown up, I only realised I was creative in the last kind of 10 years, you know, and um, so that's very late in life, realising that, because your creativity wasn't there in school. And I was educated in the Netherlands, uh, which is more advanced than most, but uh, very interesting. Yeah, it is a real shame, but all the, that they're cutting those kind of topics out and and just to mention, I don't know if you know or have heard or come across a guy in India called Sadhguru. And mm. Sadhguru has a school for kids. And the primary topic, the subjects that they teach are paint, dance, singing, music. Oh, and then they may add English and maths on as well. Mm. But the main topics, the main subjects are all the creative arts. That's what they teach in that school. So children from a very young age are taught that. They're also taught how to meditate. They've got like, he says that he can't believe it, that he got a whole room of five-year-olds sitting quietly or six-year-olds, let's say, sitting quietly doing meditation together. And yeah. it's, it, he says it's just incredible to, to witness something like that. So, yeah, anyway, 
you're out of it now, although you've had a, a, a decent career in it, and for different reasons, I guess. But what, what, why did you come up with? I'll say it now: parent guide to GCSEs. We, um, <clears throat> I sort of had a bit of a, an epiphany randomly one day uh, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. We'd, so we've we've trialled various other business ideas and we've got other bits and bobs going on. We've, we run a, web, a website for form tutors as well. So as a teacher, when you have a form group in the morning or a registration group and you're expected to run activities for them at the same time as doing the register and checking their uniform and dealing with all the dramas and making sure you know them at least vaguely a little bit. All, uh, we, we've kind of put all that stuff on a website for form tutors. It's not really taken off because schools have decided they, they can't afford £199 for the year mm. to make their form tutors' lives easier and take some of the pressure off their teachers. It's mm. basically one day's worth of cover, but um, it's uh, it's just not quite worked. And so I'm not even sure um, what, what prompted that, but I'd been working on formtimesorted.com for, for quite some time and then the idea just popped into my head that we were missing a trick here because, um, in fact, no, I remember what it was. See, look, it's because it's early in the morning. That's um, okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm on a Facebook group with um, parents of, uh, it was, my daughter was in year five at the time, and it was a year five parents group. And one of the parents had popped on to say, look, my child's got this homework. It's uh, bar modelling in maths, which is a, a newer form of things that schools are gradually adopting and it's not something that we ever learned when we were at school it's right. actually a really good visual way of working out problems okay but if you've not met it before it's not it's not particularly obvious and so she was saying she's got this homework and i can't help her with it can anybody help me figure out what i'm supposed to be doing here right and it made me realize there's just there's stuff that they're doing at school that we as parents would love to be able to help with because i mean 50 percent of their learning time is actually spent at home if you can support them properly yeah. when they're in that kind of side of things, not just in school, then they do so much better. But if you don't know where to start, then you can't you can't help. No. And even as teachers, I mean, some of the stuff she's doing in year six in English hurts my brain. <laughs> I, I can write an essay with the best of them. But if you ask me what a subjunctive clause is, not a clue. Mm. I've had to look this stuff up and try and figure it out because we didn't learn the the, the names and things of that. No. Um, we, if we did, it was more as part of learning you know, French or, or Spanish or German or something. So yes. it's, um, it's challenging. And with all the changes to GCSEs, parents just don't don't understand what's happening in school well enough to be able to support their kids. And teenagers are, are not the best at communicating, let's say. <laughs> Uh, so even if school are giving them great information about how to study and what to do and how to make sure that they get their best possible results, that doesn't get passed along to the parents. And you're busy worrying, am I doing the right thing? Should I be nagging them to revise? Should I be getting them to read their notes? Should they be doing something else? Am I nagging them too much? Am yeah. I putting too much pressure on? Should yeah. I put more pressure on? It's a whole minefield. And you, I don't think you really understand it until you've had a child we obviously had two at the same time going through GCSEs and they're chalk and cheese. And one was much better at being self-motivated than the other one. Of course. So we kind of experienced both at the same time, really. Mm. But it's it's really tough as as a parent, not just as a child going through that that phase that year. So we thought we've got what 30 years teaching experience between us. We've got parenting experience. We could do something about this. We could help. So I looked and I couldn't really find very much, if anything, online that, that did that for parents specifically. Yeah. Um, there are companies that will go into the school and do an, an evening. So you go along as a parent and you have your hour and a half of being talked at. And then that's about it. You you absorb it all. And then that's you sorted for the whole year. <laughs> or you go along to parents evening and you get five minutes with each subject. And they're all saying, this is really important. You must do this with your child. Yeah. And then you're off to the next one. And mm. it's really, it's a, a really difficult model in which to take in all that information and, and know what all the important things are. And you don't have time to ask all the questions you want. So we came up with the idea of doing sort of like a subscription box model almost. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we buy into one of those recipe box things where they, they send you all the ingredients and the recipes each week. Yes. So you just take it out and do it. 
Yeah. And, and, and it's easy. I don't have to think about it because I've ordered my three meals. I, I pick one of the meals out. It tells me what to do. Easy. Mm. Mm. We've done that with kind of coaching your, your child. So we send out a weekly email with prompts, with useful information, with the one thing you should do this week above everything else, do this thing, it will make a difference. And, uh, and that way it just arrives in your inbox. And if you follow the bite size instructions and a lot of our parents sit and read the email with their children as well, um, then it helps make sure that you are not only doing the right thing, but having the peace of mind that you're doing the right thing. Mm. It just takes away that, that constant nagging worry in the back of your head that says, you know, am I doing this right? Should I be doing something different? So, um, yeah, we've we've found that if parents are sitting with their children to read through the emails, it also takes away the whole. So, you know, when your parents ask you to do something, my mum once told me I should read the Harry Potter books because I would really love them. So mm-hmm. I did not read the Harry Potter books for That's about three right. years because she said I would like them. That's and right. I was determined that she would be wrong. And I was an adult at this point. Sorry, mum. <laughs> <laughs> so as a, as a parent, if you're advising your child your child is going to see that as nagging because that's that's the parent child relationship that's that's how it works a lot of the time yeah whereas we're providing the expert voice so that parents can then say well the experts say here is what you should be doing not just i say this is what you should be doing and that uh, by the sounds of it is taking away a lot of that that barrier almost so is there I'm really curious about this. I I love your strap line on your website, which is the hardest part of being a parent is watching a child go through something really tough and not being able to fix it for them. Yep. 100% correct. So I've got two stepsons and I saw them go through stuff. They wouldn't do their homework at all. We're just not interested in doing any of it. I mean, homework should be banned in my view anyway, but um, <laughs> they, they, uh, yeah, you're back to the nagging thing again. And then just stomping around the house saying, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. I can't do it. And, and literally having tantrums over it, mm. you know, door slamming, things being thrown around the room, you name it. And yeah, as a parent, you're totally helpless. You, you yep. don't know what to do. You have got no clue how you can help them there. Yeah, it's something we've just been talking about with our members in the last email, actually, is it's, it's often a case of it seems like the big, overwhelming, scary, scary thing. So stuff like um, if any of you have ever tried doing self-assessment tax forms, oh, my goodness. Mm. When you first have to do one of those, it seems like this huge, daunting ridiculously scary task that I'm not going to be able to do because it's the, there are just boxes and there are numbers dancing around the page and I can't do it. Mm. Once you actually start, it's not as bad as it looks. Starting is the hard part. And it's just finding that first step. What is the first thing to do that will make that easier? So instead of saying, um, go and revise maths, today you're going to go and do some maths revision. Mm. You say, right, I'm picking, uh, adding fractions. I'm going to write up my notes on adding fractions or um, I'm going to find some past paper questions on adding fractions and print them off ready to do. Those little steps make it much less big and scary and overwhelming. They take it from being a project into a task Yeah. and tasks you can tick off. Yeah. And they're just particularly, um, I'm, I'm reluctant to say it, but it tends to be more with boys than with girls, mm. just in my experience. And I don't know whether that's a kind of a gender thing or mm. whether it's uh, to do with the kind of the perceived expectations. But often we found that boys would rather not try than try and fail. Yes. Because that's a lot less threatening in terms of their perceived masculinity it's it's all to do with the way that we we talk about things and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in in changing it um uh, there's a guy uh, mr pink on twitter who's written boys don't try which uh, is an excellent book in, Mm. in terms of talking about the like the psychology almost behind this Mm. but it's um you're opening yourself up to to risk and we've all done it 
as adults, if you're if you have to step outside your comfort zone and do something that seems like you might fail, a lot of us will avoid doing that thing because we don't want to put ourselves in that position. We, we don't want to possibly fail because we don't like the way that that feels. And if you might fail at your homework or your revision or your exams, then that's actually quite a big incentive to just not try. Because yes. if you don't try, it's not your fault. It's just because you didn't try. It's not because you weren't smart enough. Mm-hmm. It's not because you weren't capable. You just didn't try. Yeah. It's easier yeah. to write that off. An easy get out. Yeah. So and, I don't know whether that's... It's it's an interesting. There's um. I, have you come across Anthony Robbins at all? Tony Robbins. Yes. American kind of um, personal development guy, and he has a phrase: "Is we do more to stay in pain than move towards pleasure." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we do more to stay in pain, so it's much easier to stay in pain and not do anything, rather than do it and actually be potentially successful. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and uh, because we go, oh no, no, that's too hard. I'm not going. I'm just not going to touch it. It's too hard. But if I do it and fail, that is more painful than the pain of not doing it. Because actually, you don't have any pain for not doing it. Yeah, you it's probably just, do a little bit, but quiet. it's it's doing the normal thing. You'll find that lots of teachers who are still in the teaching profession and are thoroughly miserable and not enjoying it, but they would rather carry on with the, you know, hours and hours of marking and all the the stress involved than try and restart a career because that's terrifying. Yeah. Even though teachers uh, of all professions have a great deal of transferable skills, there's so much you can do. It requires a whole different way of thinking and stepping outside of your comfort zone and away from the safety net. Mm. And it's, it's very much the same principle. Yeah. Wow. And okay, so so practically then, how do people sign up to this? And because that's another, you know, it's also a daunting thing as a parent to go, right, I've got to admit I'm stupid about this. Well, I haven't got the knowledge. I've got to admit this to myself that I failed here, that I've, I need some help. And in order to get that help, why should I be paying for it? The teachers are supposed to do this for my kid. Why am I having to do this? Would be my question, perhaps. <laughs> well, yeah. It, it kind of comes back to the, uh, the the thing about schools just not having not having the time. The uh, the parent consult- consultations that are five minutes each. It's it's just not enough time to get the information across. So, I don't, I don't know how parents would be expected to know. Mm. That there's so much information that uh, is out there, um, and as Emily just said, we kind of pass it all together and make it really clear and really obvious, so parents can go for a one-stop shop, get the information they need. Which, I mean, they haven't got time if they're both working particularly uh, to go and find that information. It's um, it's our job, I think, to provide it in one place, simple and easy, mm-hmm. and make it uh, understandable and hopefully ease the pain of Year Eleven. Yeah, and it's it's it is mostly about making life easier and less stressful because every single parent goes through the exact same experience of year eleven. Yeah. Either whether their child is overstressed because they're working too hard, or whether they're having to constantly nag them to do any work because they're under motivated, it's still a year of um, frustration. Frustration is probably the the key word as a parent there. Yeah. Because you. You're watching them go through something tough and you don't know what to do to fix it. Because unless you've been studying recently, you don't know the kind of study skills that they should be using. Mm -hmm. Because that's all down to um, knowing all the different kind of latest methods of research and stuff around it. What should I be doing? Should I be using mind maps? Should I be making flashcards? Should I be rereading my notes? Should Mm -hmm. I be creating myself little quizzes online? The trick is it's it's down to how you learn best. Mm. Um, So I'm very visual. I remember things better if I see them written down. Yeah. There are people who remember things better if they hear them. So you could record your notes and listen to them on your headphones, Mm -hmm. but it's about knowing that stuff. So as a teacher, I'd be great at teaching kids exactly how to get through their maths GCSE. This is what you need to know. This is what you need to do. They won't have gone home and told their parents that some of them won't have listened when I said that. 
I haven't been teaching them general study skills, though. And as a school, that's not part of the curriculum anymore. Mm. General study skills mm. is not anywhere on the curriculum in the vast majority of schools. So kids don't know. Mm. They're expected to go away and revise but yeah. nobody really tells them specifically how to do that. Yeah. Uh, and parents may well think that just revision means going upstairs, opening a textbook and rereading a chapter. Uh, and the chance of that actually going into their brain is very, very, very slim. Yes. There's so much more to making sure that information is retained and retained and readily available for the exam than just rereading it and hoping it, it sticks. It, it probably won't. And again, we come up with lots of ideas, lots of techniques that we obviously tell the parents about uh, and then they can have that discussion with the child and hopefully uh, you know, try different, uh, a variety of different revision techniques, one of which is going to probably really work for them. Mm. And it's again, it's like the subscription box idea. I could go to the shop and buy all the ingredients and look up a recipe online and do all the cooking. But that's frankly a little bit too much like effort. And I will just stick to my usual same old, same old that I know I like and I know the rest of the family will like and we won't try new recipes. That was the position we were in, which was why we decided to give this this recipe subscription a go. We wanted to be able to try something a little bit different and kind of expand our horizons a little bit. And it's made life so much easier, it turns out, because we don't have to think about it each week. It's one less thing to have to worry about. And that's what we're offering parents is that one less thing to have to worry about and, and the knowledge that you're doing it right because schools schools are putting a lot of extra time in kids in terms of uh, intervention they call it so some schools kids will go in and instead of form mm -hmm. time they'll go into an intervention class so they'll have some extra say maths for the first 20 minutes yes then there'll be lunchtime intervention classes then there'll be after school intervention classes which is just additional lesson time it's usually put in in year 11 because that's when everyone starts worrying mm -hmm. and it's an awful lot of pressure on the kids, like a ridiculous amount of pressure on the kids and a lot of work to be done. And you can see from uh, results just kind of across the, the last few years, it's not made a massive amount of difference. They've made GCSEs harder to kind of balance things out. Yeah. And all the kids are getting the same sort of level of, of focused intervention from school. Mm. And uh, GCSEs are graded kind of on a curve. So there's a, a sort of a percentage almost who will get each grade at the end of the year. Yeah. So if everyone does better than last year, so everyone gets, say, five marks better than they got than the equivalent year group got last year, then they'll just move the grade boundaries. So mm. they'll end up with the same grades as they would have got last year. That yeah. doesn't make any difference. For it to change your grade, you have to do better than someone in your year group. Someone else in your year group has to do worse like you have to make a bigger jump forwards than them i suppose okay which means it, so, so the, go on sorry no it's okay the um it, it means that there's a small number of parents so we've said we're only taking on one percent of parents as part of this coaching program because if we coach everyone then no one gets better <laughs> because they'll just change the grade boundaries yeah and and is it only parents i i'll, I'll I want to ask a question in a second about how it all got started and how you got clients, but are parents purchasing this because they have a competitive mindset and they want their kid to outperform all the other kids? I think the feedback we've had so far is that um, they're appreciating the help because they felt uh, probably felt lost. They, they, they're, mm. they're having... They're already started having the arguments might be the wrong word, but the um, the, the stubborn teenager not wanting to do anything. And, and they just need that little nudge to to know how to help them better. Yes. It's interesting because as a parent, okay, I'm a step parent and I never had my from my from my first marriage. I didn't have any kids. So my step boys were my first kids. Right. And so not really having any experience. Uh, with children, it it was doubly difficult when it came to kind of homework time because I just left it up to mum to deal with. You know, it was like easy. Well, mum, you deal with it um, type of thing. And then she struggled with it as well. 
and um so so there's a kind of thing that going through my head i mean as an example um so not having done the homework having bad behavior at school you're excluded from school or you've got to spend a day at home right and they're told then to do bbc bite size is it uh yeah, maths yeah. or something anyway no i don't want to do that so i'm like okay so mum's at work my wife claire she's at work and i'm not having to deal with this teenager um do something you know so I mean, I've been follow. I'm a quite a kind of digital guy. I know about e-learning, and I used to work for an e-learning company, business e-learning, not kind of school e-learning. But I know about Khan Academy, right? Oh yeah. yeah. So I got. I said, go on to Khan Academy, do some math stuff there. Well, he loved it because Khan Academy gave you like was gamification. It gave you like stars and little you know, gold stars and things like that, if you completed certain stuff. And he was hooked and he was flying through each lesson on there, um, learning the stuff the way that Khan Academy does it, and then doing the little tests and then achieving, achieving, achieving. Because actually he was really bright, or he is really bright, but he doesn't mm -hmm. know it. So, you know, you kind of, you're lost and you're trying to look for things and you're trying to help and doing the best you can. So. What you're doing sounds amazing. So I'm I'm really interested to know now, how did you kind of decide what package to put together? And then how did you go out to promote and sell it to parents? Well, I, I planned out a lot of what I would want because we, when we were doing this, we had very recently been through GCSEs with the boys. Yeah. So I, I kind of went through what, what advice would I have wanted? But we also, um, we built, so this was in the, in the summer holidays that we really started to properly launch and, and promote this. We built the, uh, the summer prep checklist. So the idea is we know as teachers over the summer holidays, kids will have six weeks off and a lot kind of drops out of their brains in those six weeks. <laughs> Um, it happens in every every year, but it's yeah. it's most kind of important, I guess, in year eleven. Yeah. So what we were suggesting was that they do a bit of writing up notes for their core subjects, so maths, English, and science. Just get ahead of the game slightly because you're going to have to do it at some point. And if you're having to do it during le year eleven when it's it's all very kind of pressure and homework and revision, mm. then that's just going to add to it. So get some of the stuff done over the summer. Um, Keep on top of your languages if you're doing languages, because otherwise, again, that all pops out of your head. It doesn't need to be a lot. Just, you know, 10 minutes on an app yeah. reminding yourself of some vocabulary will make yeah. all the difference. And if you've got any project work for anything like art, for example, then keeping on top of that, again, just take some of the pressure out of year 11. So the idea was it was a couple of hours a week um, just for four weeks of the summer holidays. So they got plenty of break. And we put that summer prep checklist on facebook and on twitter and advertised it right people had to sign up with their email to get their copy of the summer prep checklist yeah and we uh, we did personalized versions for people who asked so if they said my child's not doing these subjects that you've put on there could you do something with this instead yeah then i i did that and we had i think about five thousand people sign up whoa uh, across the yeah and um, about three four weeks that we were advertising yep. it yeah. um we found <laughs> Twitter was quite challenging. Yes. Um, because Twitter was unpleasant. It wasn't challenging. Yes. Uh -huh. There were people on Twitter who saw what we were doing and decided that clearly what we meant was chain your child to a desk for eight hours a day during the summer and don't let them have a holiday. Right. Which was absolutely the opposite of what we were doing. And so we were... Uh, we were called some names, yeah. weren't we? We were accused of uh, messing around with their, you know, um, cashing mental, in on mental and, health. Yeah, I mental think was health my, and, my favourite. Uh, even though cashing in, it was a free uh, summer prep checklist. But yeah, that's Twitter for you. And mm. um, so yeah, uh, that that wasn't immensely fun. Um, but we we advertised this. We had five thousand people then who were wanting to to know about the launch. So we just sent out lots of useful information, stuff that they would all kind of want to know and would be helpful in the run up to starting year 11. Yeah. And then we launched the week before school started and um, 
made back all our advertising money in the first week, which was fabulous, uh, which told us that we definitely were on to the right thing. And part of the email sequence was to ask people, what do you want us to cover? What do you want to know? Which meant we then got to build the program around the questions that people had asked us. Mm -hmm. So there was stuff that we put in because you don't always know what you don't know. And as teachers, we see things from a slightly different perspective than you would if you're a parent without the experience in the education sector. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've kind of got a balance of the things that parents think they want to know and the things that we know would help them if they knew and, uh, and been able to develop that. So we've talked everything from making the most of mocks and not letting those be a ridiculous amount of pressure because what they should be is a dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. They are for finding out what you don't know yet yeah. and, uh, and addressing the issues, not for making you feel stupid. Um, and we've talked about subject specific stuff. So things like Khan Academy, um, we've been talking a lot about Corbett maths because we love Corbett maths. It does a similar thing only without the gamification quite so much. Right. But um, he does video tutorials of everything. There are then questions and answers and worked examples and all sorts to make it really, really super obvious what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be doing it. Yeah. And, and, and we've kind of, we've talked motivation, we've talked stress reduction, we've talked um, that kind of, that getting started, getting in the zone has been our, our latest one and avoiding distractions. Yeah the cost of distractions because pausing for a moment to answer an email loses you about 30 minutes worth of concentration of, of productivity yeah. according to studies. Yeah. So and, and probably speech. more and probably yeah. more. I think that's a really conservative one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because you got your phone you're not going to revise. It's as simple as that. No. And the number of notifications that our kids get certainly between Snapchat and, and WhatsApp and, all sorts instagram and yeah, yeah. it's yeah. constant and and it's really difficult i mean i i get slight anxiety if i'm separated from my phone for too long so i don't know how they feel and uh, putting it away or putting it on silent or do not disturb so that i can get some actual focus work done yeah. i can get more done in a in a half an hour in the zone yeah. than i can in two hours of kind of constant pinging and distractions and that's a really important life skill, not just for GCSEs, but for everything. If you can, if you can focus on what you need to focus on, it frees up so much more of your other time yeah. to actually have a life that it's it's worth everyone learning. I think. Yeah, I mean, we could have a whole podcast about social media because oh, yeah. I was a massive fan whenever it started ten years ago, and I'm no longer a big fan anymore. Um, I can see what has happened to the world. Uh, I can see, I mean, you've made a you know point about Twitter and yeah, Twitter is just a place for people to vent their ridiculous comments that they can hide behind. Um, yeah, I had, we had no idea that it could be like that. I think when we started this, we, we were genuinely shocked and it did get to the stage where, um, I, I had to take over looking at the notifications because Emily um, was starting to get affected by it. You know, it was not good for her mental health reading this vitriol uh, that was being posted online when all we're trying to do is help people. We're not, um, yeah, yeah no, nothing more than that, nothing less. So, so it's an interesting point to, to digress slightly is um, not, I don't know if you have it, but I think one of the things in your set of guides and information, I would, if you haven't already got it, and I'm happy to help you with this, you definitely need to put something in there about social media and to how, yes. because parents haven't got a clue. I mean, first of all, they're addicted already, right? Mm -hmm. They've yeah. bought them the devices. There are no rules necessarily in place. Uh, and if any rules are put in place, I've I've had it been on the receiving end of it as well, you know. And these were just iPods; these weren't even phones, and they were being thrown around the room. And so, because it can get really, really tricky, you know, in terms of your relationship with your kids about their devices, because it's like that you're taking their left arm away when you take it off them. Um, yeah, we have. Um, we did a thing. Uh, or sent something out free about um, 
for example, Netflix, where it's a fantastic um, platform, obviously. Yes, it is. But yeah. as you're watching uh, whatever the uh, the episode is, it finishes and it does assure you that in 15 seconds, yes. the next one will start. And yeah. it's so easy just to keep going. Yeah. Um, the revision, I'll do that later, maybe mm. tomorrow, maybe next week. Mm. Yeah. And um, a lot of parents don't realise how things like Netflix, Amazon Prime Video work uh, and the way it just spools up the next one and keeps and YouTube, going. Until, and YouTube, exactly yeah. the yeah, same. YouTube, yeah. Yeah, but there are settings on mm. all of them. They are, there are. stop that from happening. It's just you have to actually go in and do mm. that. And things like, um, so Snapchat, we didn't realise, I think until we, we confiscated one of the boys' phones for a while, but on Snapchat, they get a streak. That's right. So, um, I think yeah, they've they... stopped it now. I think they have huh? stopped it. I think oh, they no, have no. stopped it, yeah. Because uh, he was we'd, – we'd taken his phone because he'd I don't know, done something. Mm. And it was – Being a Muppet. It yes. was causing him almost physical pain that he was going to lose all of his streaks. That's right. Because he was going to miss out on continuing these conversations daily with people, which is what you, you get your streak for. Yeah. And that, that pressure – is ridiculous oh, and his response to it by the way was to give his uh, snapchat password to a mate that's right who could then log in as him keep that's his right. streaks going which is you know handing out passwords to social media is possibly the biggest no-no ever but that was better than yep. than losing his 28 day streak with the uh, with with that's george right. or whoever it was, that's right. it, it was ridiculous so so yeah. There is a, I don't know if you've seen a TED talk uh, by a chap called Tristan Harris. Um, make a note, it'd be worth checking it out because you'll enjoy it, what he says. He's an ex-Google employee. He's an ex-Google ethicist. I can't even say it properly. But he was looking at ethical things in Google. And he said there is a room in Google which has engineers in it not many, let's say 30, their, their prime task of those engineers is to keep us addicted to the internet. And that's all they do. Oh, They're looking at sorry. ways to keep us addicted to the internet and keep going back. Because why? Google, Facebook, Twitter, all Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, all of them, you know, they all need advertisers right, to make their billions. And the only way advertisers will go there is when they see the stats of how many people are active users every single day, month, year, whatever. Yeah. And active users are people that log on or look, you know, because they can see that you're looking or that you're scrolling or whatever. Scrolling is the new smoking, by the way. And oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, all of them need advertisers. They need the stats to give advertisers to attract them. Because yeah. if you haven't got eyeballs going on your site, you're not going to advertise yeah. there, right? Yeah. Which also means that every small business as well are getting sucked in. So there's some people I, I mean, this is not about me and what I feel about these things. So I'm going to switch back to you in a second. But I think it's important to mention whilst we're at it on, on the subject. Um, in America, some guys that I listen to on podcasts in America, they say, actually, advertising is actually now a tax. It's a mm. tax that people are having to pay to get their products and services in front of other people. And it's just ridiculous nowadays. <laughs> so um, anyway, we digress on social media. We could literally have a whole other hour discussion on it. Um mm. It sounds amazing what you're doing. So how long have you been going? Remind me. Um, we launched three or four months ago. Yeah, yeah just August. at the start of this academic year. And how so is it going? Very new. How are you feeling <laughs> with it all? Uh, well, I'm feeling a lot better because uh, up until, um, well, I should have been going back uh, as a teacher in September, but I, I quit in um, sort of, well, late July, August time. Right. Uh, so I feel fantastic. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And Emily? <laughs> I feel fab. We're, uh, we're loving what we're doing, and the feedback has been amazing from our, from our customers. So it, it, it's good. It shows us that we're, we're doing the right thing, and we are actually helping and making a difference, which is, is what we wanted to do. So, um, so yeah, we're just, we're, as you were saying, we're busy trying to figure out how we get the word spread a little more yeah. widely, because obviously, since we're new, nobody has heard of us. No. And 
because this is a whole new thing, really, mm. GCSE support for parents specifically, it's um, it's something that people aren't looking for because they don't know that it exists. So we're busy trying to figure out how we do that without having to pay a small fortune in advertising. Yes. Because uh, that takes away from what we can then do for our customers because that's where our budget is going, mm. which makes us sad, frankly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, uh, so, yeah, that's uh, it's. It's exciting. It's a new challenge every day, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Brilliant. And and how many? I can see on your website you've got different packages. So just talk us through that briefly, so people know what what they can expect to see. Well, um, we have the the basic package, which is kind of the the standard stuff that you'd want to know. So things about revision and about exam techniques, and we uh, for each subject. Um, we do a printable checklist of things that you've got to be able to cover. Yeah. So uh, subjects come with a specification, which is long and wordy and includes lots of information for teachers. We filtered that into just what you need to know yeah. so that you, your child can then tick off as they revise each thing. So that's included in the, the basic package. You get full access to everything on the website. We've got a, um, a revision planner that we're nearly ready to launch. We're just finishing the last bits of testing which is going to let you auto-generate a revision plan or, you know, monitor, create your own kind of thing just to make life that a little bit easier because making a revision plan is insanely painful, Mm. it turns out, which Mm -hmm. takes us on to our next couple of tiers. Um, On the premium tier, which is our middle tier and Mm -hmm. our most popular tier, it includes all the stuff that you get in the basic package but also support for planning forwards. So, thinking about um, sixth form and the kind of things you're going to need to be able to do to get into sixth form, how to choose your subjects for sixth form, Mm. uh, how to choose the place you want to study at sixth form, and then going forwards to to university as well. If you're planning on university or something equivalent, then you need to start thinking about your personal statement because that's what gets you in. The reason I got myself into Cambridge was because I had a great deal of experience and I wrote a blooming good statement yes to get me that interview mm. which was then got me onto the mm. course yeah and and you've got to start that early because you can't wait until five minutes before it's due in and then decide you're going to go and get some work experience and mm. start doing some volunteer work and things you've got to have been doing that all the way along so starting planning that early makes a massive difference yeah and um, and we're also talking helping kids who are overstressed and uh, parents to know how to help them deal with that and manage their stress levels and ditto for the opposite where they're lacking in motivation and you you need some little help nudges in the right direction let's say yeah um and then the the vip tier is very much the same thing you get everything that you've had in the previous packages but you also get uh, we've created a bespoke revision plan for each of our vip members Mm -hmm. so they can say this is what i want i want this much on this day this much on this day here's what they're doing prioritize this not so much of this and we'll draft them a full revision plan including topic level detail Mm. so rather than revise maths today it'll be revised maths revised fractions revised you know something specific within that so it just makes it easier to to follow and then we have a teacher on tap service so if they have any questions at any point, they can email us and we will find them the answer magically. It has been quite interesting with the uh, VIP package. There's been uh, a range of parents and um, some have said, you know, for example, in the first term, they want to just do uh, or they want their child just to do half an hour of vision uh, on a school day, uh, maybe a half an hour, half an hour on the weekend as well. Mm-hmm. Just in that first term, into the second term, into the spring term after Christmas, uh, it goes up to two half hour slots uh, after school mm-hmm. and uh, and then um, and the final term is only about three or four weeks before exams start. They'll do three half hour slots, which it sounds very, very sort of light touch almost. But actually, once you do the maths and work out how many hours of revision that is, uh, it's, it's hundreds, 150 hours, 200 wow. hours of revision just doing that, that small first step mm. um, and half an hour with no social media, just focusing I don't think is a huge ask on, on most teens. No. And just get it done, get into the routine. And to see those kind of plans, you know, being sent out and, and the feedback coming back is it really does help them to uh, focus their minds, know what they've got to revise uh, and, and they're making progress with that. Wow. Yeah. I, there is a really, 
it has been researched a lot about small steps, hasn't it? In terms yeah. of if you do something small to begin with, um, they they say if you want to if you want to start running uh, on the first day, get out of bed, um, and just put your your running shoes on. That's yeah. all you do yeah. on day one. <laughs> yeah. Day two, go downstairs <laughs> with your yeah. running shoes on. Step outside. That's all you do on day two. <laughs> Yeah. And then day three, walk down the street and then come back. I mean, literally tiny, tiny steps because yeah. it's back to if you if you are told, right, you've got to do three hours or two, even two hours, you kind of go, no way. There's no way I'm going to want to do that. I've got yeah. far better things to do, like watch Netflix and go on social media. Um, it's so the same as a, a teacher at Christmas. If you bring a class set of books home, uh, and you know it's going to take you four hours to mark it, there's a fairly good chance on the last day of the uh, of the Christmas holiday you'll be doing that four-hour session of marking. Yes. Because you yeah. don't want to start it. However, if at the start of the holiday you did that first couple of books, which took you 15, 20 minutes, whatever, and then carried on doing that, it's so much easier, the small steps, far less daunting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we, we talk about marginal gains a lot, that little 1% improvement that you can make yeah. that you can build on each week that by the time you get to the end has made a gigantic difference. But it's just, it's those little bits because if you try and make a big change all in one go, it's, it's too much. It's, it puts mm. you off. It's the same as if you go on a crash diet. That's why everybody pings straight back to their weight mm. within a few months yeah. because it's too big a change. Mm -hmm. It's not small, gradual, mm. baby, baby steps. And our, our biggest advice in terms of procrastination, if you've got, something you or your child is procrastinating about is just do five minutes. Mm. That's all you have to do. Five mm. minutes, mm. five minutes of looking at the tax return and figuring out what you need to find. Cause by the time you've done your five minutes, often you've figured out, actually, this isn't as bad as I thought it was. And you'll carry on for That's a little right. bit. That's it's, right. it's starting. As you said, it's, it's putting on your running shoes. It's that uh, first step. And on the VIP package, all of the parents, they, they had free choice to do. You know, they can design it however they want. Mm. I think most of them sat down with the team to, to come up with a plan. And, and all of them uh, have built from, from the bottom small steps to start off with. Mm. And as it gets closer and closer to exams, the, kind of the, the hours have gone up. But I guess that's just a, a natural thing where you, you need to start uh, working that much harder towards exam time. But, yeah, it's sure. a real... Um, you know, uh, slow and steady start, uh, ramping it up towards the end. And, and all of the programs that we've been asked to do have been exactly the same, pretty much. Yeah. Sounds amazing. It's so fascinating to hear and that you're so young as a startup. So congratulations to you both. Um, Thank you. So I've got two questions left. And, and that is, the first question is, is there something that I haven't teased out of you that you still want to say? <laughs> then please say it. And the, and the second question is, where can people find you and connect with you and learn more about it? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to start with the second part first. Okay. Um, so my husband has, has just run off with my post-it that had all of the things that I needed to remember <laughs> to tell you all because he was tidying, um, which is it's nice, much. but still. Um, so you can find us uh, predominantly on Facebook, so we've mostly gone for Facebook. We have a Facebook page, right. Parent Guide to GCSE, but we also have a Facebook group. So we have over 800 parents who are all in the same boat. They've got kids at various stages from sort of year nine through to year 11. I think we might have some younger as well uh, who get on there to to share their experiences, to vent their frustrations, to ask for <laughs> advice. And they're just a lovely, lovely bunch of people. They've been so helpful to each other. It's been yeah. amazing. So if you are in this boat as well, get yourself on the Facebook group. It's all totally free to join. Um, and you can find us on Twitter at Parent Guide GCSE. There is no two in that one right. because Twitter was being awkward. I can't remember. Yeah, it makes exactly sense happened. to be, yes. Parent makes guide sense to be shorter, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then you can find details of everything that we do on www.parentguide2gcse.com. Um, and the the thing I probably wanted to mention was the podcast. So we have a podcast of our very, very own. And we have interviewed uh, John Lamerton, who did uh, Routine Machine. So he is a best-selling author 
and talks about how to set up great routines, which is really useful, not just for kids, but for, for us as well. Um, we've talked with an English expert because English tends to be the most puzzling thing. How on earth do you revise for, for English? It's not a, a really obvious checklist almost. So he's given us some great advice on, on how you how you get the most out of your your both language and literature English exams. Yeah. And um and then we've we've spoken with actually an ex student of ours to talk about getting students to aim a little bit higher. So thinking about their aspirations because a, l- a large part of the battle is if they know what they want to do, if they know what they're working towards, yeah. It's much easier to get them to do something. Yeah. Um and uh, so he's uh, talked about that. We've got lots of other great things lined up. So if uh, if you are in that position, if you've got kids in or shortly to do their GCSEs, then you can track down our podcast as well, which is Parent Guide to GCSE. And it should be in all the places good podcasts are. Um, if you find one where we're not, then email me and let me know and I will get it in there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, definitely that that's the challenge nowadays is making sure we're everywhere with our podcast well yeah i mean the best place i think for the future for podcasts is going to be spotify um they're making a big push they bought a podcast hosting platform called anchor.fm which i use for another podcast as well who are very good and free and uh, for hosting and everything so yeah it's it's for me, I think it's probably going to be, it should be Apple, but they haven't really done a, a good enough job there. And I think Spotify have done a better job with music, but we, we digress. Okay, so, I like it. <laughs> anything else? Um, no, I, think I think that's it. Nice. Thank you very much. Yes, thank well, you very much for having us. Thank you. I know we've gone over a little bit on the time that we allotted, but I think there were some really important things I managed to tease out of you. And thank you so much for sharing openly and honestly what you've been through and where you are now. And I'm delighted that you're both stress-free and enjoying. There will be stresses with work, but it's different stresses. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I'd really wish you the best of luck. This is so needed. I think this is just a fantastic product. And I'm looking forward to seeing you, you know, on talk shows, on the BBC, on ITV <laughs> and everywhere, you know, to get promoted and on the radio and <laughs> in other places. And I'll, I'll make sure that once I publish this, it, it gets seen as much as possible all over the place. Fabulous. Well, there's a book in the works, so I shall keep you posted on that one as well. Oh, yes, please. And I will, once it's out, I'll add it to the to the blog post on, on this podcast so that, you know, the, the show notes and everything, so when people come across it, they'll find your book as well. Amazing. <laughs> well, uh, good luck with everything in thank you Peterborough. Very much. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Delighted to have my first double guests on the podcast as well. Uh, and on such a wonderful topic. Um, So I will put all the links in the show notes, Facebook, your website, Twitter, etc. And wish you amazing success. Take care and bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 